Welcome to Plastic Model Mojo, a podcast dedicated to scale modeling, as well as the news and events around the hobby, where we hope to be informative and entertaining and help you keep your modeling mojo alive. Well, fellow modelers, 2020 is certainly not going out without a fight. Dave and I dealt with some serious internet bandwidth issues during the recording of this episode. We slogged through it and managed to finish it out, but we weren't sure we had at the end of it, and we were a bit nervous going into edit. But things seem to have turned out pretty much normal despite all the difficulties. So I am quite happy to be able to bring to you, on time, episode 26 of Plastic Model Mojo. Welcome back, Dave. Sure got cold quick in Kentucky, didn't it? It did indeed. Uh, how are you doing, Mike? I understand that you got a little bit of the white stuff over there. I uh, consider we're only about 70 miles separated. We got a lot more than you did. Yeah, we about three inches of snow. Uh, we had some Monday, then it all melted, then it snowed again, but the temperature dropped, so it's kind of persisting now. It's still out there. So, Yeah, we got about a, qu- we got about a quarter of inch here. What's going on in your model sphere over the last couple of weeks? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, as people who who uh, go to our Facebook page know, uh, uh, I finished up number four for the year, the A-Model AS-1 Kennel uh, Soviet uh, cruise missile, uh, air-to-surface missile. And that la- leads me to a ritual that happens every time I finish a model. No matter how many models I've got in progress, no matter what, when I finish a model, I clean up, I, I've, I completely stop and clean up my workspace. And I kind of wonder if every if other modelers do that too. I thought you were going to say rub it in Mike's face. Well, okay. That's just, that's, that's, that's a bonus. That's a side bonus, but uh, <laughs> uh, you're making great progress on the poll. So I'm, I'm, I'm not too confident in the, in the rubbing, but I do wonder if other modelers, when you, it's like there's a sense of completion and a ritual that you got to put your workspace back together and get it organized again before you can go on to the next project or switch over to the next project. Do you do that? Kind of the fresh start mentality. Yes, I do. But I also stop, you know, we call it critical mess. Once we achieve critical mess, it's time to clean up a little bit when you lose that exacto handle right in front of your face. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm bad about taking stuff out and just putting it somewhere on the bench when I'm in the middle of a build. So, uh, Mike, uh, what do you, what's your modeling fluid of choice tonight? <laughs> you did it again, Dave. Oh, what'd I do? <laughs> I got to tell you what's been going on. Oh, in my I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell with you, Mike? It's just, <laughs> I'm taking over the ship. <laughs> it's mutiny i'll put to put it in the outline yeah that's right so, so well you responded to me and that's all that counted so mike uh what's up in your model sphere after all that feedback from the death of the hobby uh it got me thinking because a lot of it was about gunplay and warhammer so we actually have a uh a shop here in town so jack and i ran across town my son jack uh, we ran across town last weekend to the Warhammer store, which is a games work- workshop cor- corporate store we have here in Lexington. Yeah. Uh, just to look around, I'm not saying I'm going to delve into that, but uh, I was just curious about, you know, what all was available and, and how much it cost and how complex it was and all that. And it was really interesting because, I mean, it's all they've got in there, right? They've got Warhammer. I think there's a couple of flavors of that. Maybe right. more than that. I I know nothing about it, but um, a lot of interesting vehicles and aircraft. It's not cheap, but that's neither here nor there, really. But it's, this shop was managed interestingly by this uh, nice young gal who said she used to be a bartender and interviewed for the position as managing the store. It's a corporate store. It's not a franchise. So she's employed by Games Workshop and uh, just went in for curiosity. And she uh, she showed me around and told me all about it and uh, – I thanked her, and uh, we went on went on our merry way. So, so did you? Did they have anything displayed, built from uh, people in the area who've been 
you know, getting these things and painting them and doing all that? Very little, but the shop has been made COVID friendly. Oh, okay. So they've pushed a lot of things back to the storeroom to get more floor space. Gotcha. Uh, so it was not their typical floor format. So I don't know. That's what I did. That's what I've been doing the last two weeks. It's kind of not at the bench. Well, good. Well, good. So, Mike, uh, what uh, is your modeling fluid of choice tonight? Uh, it's a beer night for me. I'm drinking Narragansett lager. <laughs> the reason that's so funny is, you know, I've been doing nothing but beers for the f- past number of episodes and uh, afraid of losing my title as an honorary Kentucky colonel, I had to go back to bourbon tonight. Well, we'll get there. Th- th- this is a, uh, uh, I, would, I would call it a utility beer. Beer folks will know what that is. Is it batting cleanup? It's fine. It's a, it's an okay beer. It's a, originally from a Pawtucket, Rhode Island, but it's, they got, I guess, a satellite brewery in Rochester, New York. So it's not bad. It's a good uh, thirst quencher. Um, I like it because it's in a pint can, so you don't have to go to the fridge as often. <laughs> I've seen that in Kroger's. They've, Kroger's has started carrying that. So a little nod to our friends up east because this is one of their beers. What about you? Well, uh, it's it's ironic you're doing beer tonight because uh, I've been doing a lot of beers the last uh, number of podcasts and not wanting to lose my honorary Kentucky Colonel status. I felt uh, obligated to go back to a bourbon and I got a Knob Creek smoked maple bourbon and it's about mm. 90 per, it's about 90 proof. So it's on the high side for a bourbon. And when they say smoked maple, they mean smoked maple. It is, that flavor profile is well forward. It is actually sweeter than Maker's Mark. So it is extremely sweet. I'm drinking it on the rocks. And the first sip was really strong, really mapley, really sweet. almost to the point of offensiveness. But as the ice melts and waters it down a little bit, it's actually not bad. Uh, I I could see myself enjoying this. This would be an interesting thing to mix with, uh, say, uh, a Coke or a 7-Up. I bet you you would get a really interesting flavor out of that. But uh, no, I like it. Uh, It'll get me through this episode for sure. Well, the mailbag's full again, Dave. That's good news, Mike. First up is uh, Matt Dyer from Gilbert, Arizona. And uh, Matt admits to being one of the more senior modelers. (laughs) He's had the uh, typical progression as a kid modeler and then uh, got out of it for military service and a career, uh, which is also as an attorney. So maybe you guys can talk shop sometimes. But uh, he's gotten back into modeling now and... Although we haven't had many lately, he loves the shows, but not so much the contests. And he's says he's been put out by judges with magnification hoods on high intensity flashlights. <laughs> I, you know, we hear that a lot. And unfortunately, sometimes that is what's needed to separate, you know, the top two or three or one or two or whatever. But uh, I can understand where he's coming from. And kind of counter to that, he runs by the mantra that is established by jazz great Duke Ellington. To paraphrase, if it looks good, it is good. Well, and that makes a point where we are, I mean, there's nothing more ego affirming than going to a contest and winning a, winning an award or something. But really, that's not what the hobby is about. You know, it is ultimately being satisfied with what you built because you're building it for yourself. You're not, you're not building it for other people. Uh, so, you know, I, I do understand his his uh, concern sometimes that uh, model judges and model judging can be a little off-putting. But you know what? If you don't take it as seriously, if you view it for what it really is, you're not there for the contest. You're there for the vendor room and seeing your modeling friends and doing all that stuff. And if you happen to walk away with an award, great. If you don't, that's okay, too. He's also got a blog called Matt's Models and Comments. And I had a look, 
And he's already banged out that Airfix Doolittle Raider, Dave. So you're going to have to step it up a notch. (laughs) You notice what wasn't on the email list I sent you, don't you, Mike? Yeah, I saw that or didn't see it. So we'll, we'll, Matt, we'll get your uh, blog uh, URL in the show notes and uh, plug it on the Facebook page as well. So it's not bad. Everybody go have a look. Matt's models and comments. Good job. Who's next? Uh, John Fincher from West Frankfurt, Illinois. And uh, apparently he's a mutual friend of uh, Jim Bates. Yeah. Sorry about that, John. The misery loves company, <laughs> brother. That's right. <laughs> um, you know, we talked a lot about Zoom meetings in our last episode. Well, not a lot, but we mentioned it, you know, how it kind of played into some of these folks not liking them. Yeah. Being put out, being put out by the, the non-personal, personable feel and just not being able to see their modeling friends because of the COVID. But uh, he says the, he says the zoom meetings have saved his sanity over this dreadful year. And he's been able to connect with uh, past clubs. It's like he's IPMS Seattle for one. So I assume that's how he knows Jim and yep. uh, friends all over the country, if, if not the entire world. So certainly I can agree with that. I, I do too. Uh, you know, the, the group build that I'm, involved in on the mosquito uh the five of us have a once a month or once every three weeks or once a month scheduled zoom meeting and uh you know so we all see where we are on the build and update each other and talk about what we've encountered and and all of that which takes up about 15 to 20 minutes of our get together and we spend the next hour and a half exactly as if you were sitting, you know, uh, at a model contest around a a table at a bar waiting for the model and judging to be done, where you sit there and you just talk about different things and the conversation wanders back and forth. And the next thing you know, you look down and it's been two hours. I do think that Zoom can be a real uh, a, a real lifeline for folks who are isolated from their uh, their in in person meet meet space as the as the people used to say uh, modeling friends and I'm not so sure that might not be one of the I don't want to say benefits of this pandemic but one of the silver linings at least is that folks who are out where they don't have a model club within driving distance of them and therefore don't get to attend uh, regular meetings, may be able to group together and and meet, you know, either as part of a, a virtually as part of an in-person meeting or group together with other folks who are in a similar situation and meet virtually and have basically an online modeling club of people who aren't near enough to other modelers to attend an in-person meeting. So I think that the mainstreaming of Zoom may actually uh, may actually end up having some benefits for our hobby. It's for- forced a lot of people to take on that technology. Yes, it has. Well, he also, ha- also has a more poignant note. Uh, He says he recently had the unfortunate task of coming up with some photos for the family of a fellow modeler that had suddenly passed away. Um, And then to his disappointment, out of thousands of photographs he had taken over the years of models, at contests, etc., so many that he adds that he can't remember who built them or why even photographed them. He he managed to come up with just a handful of photographs of his friend. So now he makes it a point to photograph people at shows and meetings and events, albeit posed or candid or whatever. Uh, And he says to quote, the models are what brings us together, but the people are why I keep going. And I want to remember them. They're always new models, but finding new friends is a lot tougher. That is a fantastic point. When this particular, when I've attended a lot of nationals, 22 or 23 of them. And I've got more photos of more models than I can count. And and I do occasionally go back and look through them and look at them. And a lot of the photos I take are models that inspired me that I really liked or, or whatever. But my favorite photos from all of the nationals are shots that I that I've taken of friends or with friends. In fact, a 
uh, at the last nationals in Chattanooga two years ago, uh, or a year and a half ago, uh, I've got photos with Dana Bell. I've got photos of, of Jim and I with uh, Roy Sutherland and, you know, just people that the only time I see them is at the nationals. And those are kind of the photos that bring you the most joy out of it. So that's, that's a great idea and a great tip is when you go to these contests, don't forget to snap a couple of photos of the guys who were there so that you can look back and reminisce about the time you spent at that contest with those folks eating and drinking and talking modeling. He closes with, I'm glad you two have this podcast to share and hope to see you at a show sometime soon. So, well, good on you, John. I like this. I like this one a lot, Dave. Yeah, I agree. And from your lips to God's ear, I I hope we all see each other at model contests soon because I don't know about you. It's uh, the, this has been, (laughs) this has been a tough year. Next up is Roger Foss from Chico, California. He's a new listener who just took in his first episode recently. He's a builder of 32nd scale aircraft and 35th scale armor primarily, but peppers in a little bit of everything else, according to his email here. So welcome aboard, Roger, and glad to have you as a listener. Amen. Uh, the, uh, the crux of his email was that he's also an author and an artist, and ask what we think about balancing other hobbies with scale modeling, and and uh, have has anyone had to uh, to deal with such? Now I'll start here. I, I am a scale modeler, and I am a military collector. And for a long time there, I was also a model railroader, or better said, a railroad modeler, because I never had a railroad. It, it got to a point where I just had to chuck one of them. Uh, I kind of got out of the model railroading bit for the most part, not entirely, but I divested of that as far as stash and, and, uh, all the peripherals for the railroad I was never going to build. All that's gone. I still have some projects I keep around to work on every now and then. But for an author and an artist whose work can generate an income, I don't know that that's necessarily (laughs) the advice I would give Roger, but (laughs) it's an interesting point. Um, in fact, he said he'd sold something recently. I can't remember if it was a, a, uh, a written piece or an art piece, but anyway, somebody gave him money for something he created, which is always a good thing. Yeah. Uh, I've got other interests and I, I, I'm an avid reader. And in fact, I think I've said before that the model wife uh, refers to me as a librarian who, who builds models rather than a modeler. So, but I'll be honest, my one and only, and by hobby, I mean what I do to relax, what I do to, you know, get time away from the world and decompress. And for me, that's modeling. And that's that's really the only hobby that I have in that regard. Um, there are other things I dabble in, but modeling is my hobby. So... Which is sad because you would think if that was the case, I would produce more and better models. But, you know, what can I say? <laughs> you do all right, Dave. Uh, I guess the only thing I might add is is that you can certainly have all these things, but as soon as you're making so- yourself do one of them, it might be time to go to one of the others. You know what, I, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, um, yeah. It, at some point, they're not hobbies. And the, 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 the writing and the art, Outside of scale modeling, I, I could cur- certainly see those taking up a lot of time. Uh, you can't do them all at the same time. You might could think about writing and what you might paint or sculpt while you're modeling. But uh, I, I think to, to, to devote serious time with them, you, you can't be in a situation where you're making yourself do one over the other. At, at that point, it's time to stop and go do the thing you'd rather be doing. So exactly. multiple hobbies may give you avenue to... <laughs> to uh, keep your mojo up by moving, moving to various activities. I don't know. It's an interesting question. Uh, If anybody else out there has got any kind of multiple hobbies or um, extracurricular kind of interests that they juggle, let us know. And we'll, uh, we'll help uh, Roger get those kind of comments as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, back again is Andrew Armstrong from New York and his one three fiftieth Iwo Jima. (laughs) Uh, he appreciates our encouragement. So that's good to hear. Yeah. It's the reason we're doing this. That's right. Um, 
He's not started the ship yet because he's still got a couple other things going, like he told us last time. But he has started work on some of the other smaller accessories, namely the aircraft. So he's got a little flock of Ospreys he's working on. So that's a start. And that makes a good point. Something that I have I've noticed with really good modelers that I admire when they take on modeling projects, particularly big complex projects like uh, scratch building something or, or uh, you know, a, a, a large model or, or all, they take it, as, they approach it as matters of sub-assemblies and they make each sub-assembly a model unto itself. And I think that's a really good approach for something that's large that looks too big to swallow in one bite is to approach, you know, let's say you're building a a 72nd scale aircraft or 48th or 32nd, you know, approach just the radial engine as a model unto itself. Approach the cockpit as a model unto itself. And when you break it down into those smaller bites, it's it's not as overwhelming to do. So I highly encourage doing something like that. Mike Wood from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. That might be a first from Edmonton. Mm-hmm. Reckon reckon he's a hockey fan. I was I would hope there's not much else to do in Edmonton, and they've got a good hockey team. So yeah. So he's three years back from a thirty year hiatus, All and right. primarily Welcome World back. War Two armor in thirty fifth scale. Which is interesting. There's a modeler from the Alberta area up there named Tom Cockle. It was one of my great influencers of of the 90s, during the 90s and early 2000s. I don't know if he's in Edmonton, but he's certainly in, from Alberta. He used to be a contributor to Fine Scale and uh, the American military modeler. But anyway, you might look him up, Mike. I know he's got a Facebook page or Facebook profile because he friended me even though he doesn't know who i am he wants to know what we think about foregoing commercial weathering products and creating our own says some are easy to make and others seem to be repackaged and uplifted products that are readily available for less money at other venues what do you think i actually have a thought or two on this um you know uh uh mig ammo came out with the oil brushers and i actually tried uh using them on on the torpedoes on the the bibber and the formulation that they use they the uh, thinner must be hotter than what i use when i make an oil wash and it actually attacked the underlying paint i i prefer in most cases if i'm doing an oil wash Instead of using a prepackaged product, I'll use low odor mineral spirits and tube oils. And while it may take a a couple of minutes to whip it up, I can customize the color exactly to what I want. I can get the thickness or thinness that I want. A lot of these weathering products are convenience. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that they all are, but... I think a, a lot of them are developed for for convenience so that the modeler can get to the finished product. Weathering has become more and more intensive in the last 20 years. More and more attention is being paid not only to the finish, but to the weathering of a model. And I think a lot of these things are simply shortcuts to try and make it easier for a modeler to get through that phase. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm all for, you know, uh, uh, using the homegrown products where they work for you. And as, as the writer pointed out, almost always that's cheaper than buying the prepackaged pro- uh, weathering product. I do a little bit of both. I use, tube oils and my own thinners and i use some of the prepackaged and and some of them i like uh the splashers from mig ammo i I like those Mm -hmm. a lot because of the the consistency of them uh i think would get kind of tedious to replicate every time i wanted to use it and the colors uh he also offers some skepticism about like you know the ak weathering pencils compared to other 
uh, artist type watercolor pencils. I know you like those things and a lot of people do. Now I don't know I don't know if they've are they, if they're formulated specifically for scale model use if there's something different about them I don't know I've never used them. I will say I understand his skepticism and and I I to be honest with you I initially had it too. But there does seem to be something different about the AK pencils. The the watercolor and this is hard to describe, and I know I'm not gonna uh, not gonna do a good job of it. But the watercolor pencil pencils from AK are more oily. I, I, I know that's weird, uh, creamy, oily. I don't know what to describe. So that the consistency of them, as opposed to a regular water oil uh, watercolor pencil from an uh, artist store. They're different. They truly are different, and they're because of the consistency they have. They seem to be more controllable than just a regular store bought artist watercolor pencil. Um, but I was, believe me, I was exactly as skeptical as 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 our writer is when I first saw the product, and and so at first I only bought a couple of them to test them out. And, and I'm, the more I use them, the more I'm liking them. So that's one area in which I think that it's, and those things are so cheap anyway, they're like two, $3 a pencil. They're so inexpensive anyway, it's, it's worth going ahead and paying for them for the quality that I've experienced with them. I also wonder if the color palette is more skewed toward model favorable things as opposed to the more the artist colors. I, I don't know. I've never, I've never looked at them to compare. So I'm just talking off the top of my head. Yeah. Bob Blair from Charlotte, North Carolina. Mike, it's your fault. Uh-oh. <laughs> That's what I say all the time. <laughs> uh, he's had 50 years of modeling in one medium or another. First plastic model as a kid, then a major stint in RC cars, then high powered rocketry, you know, the FAA clearance type stuff. Yep, I some do. crazy stuff there. And then back to plastic again. So he's back into plastic again. So he's been home since March, like a lot of us. I'm not, but a lot of folks we know are, are homebound still. Um, our podcast and others have helped him trying all sorts of, uh, or have him trying all sorts of products, paints, and airbrushes, and bourbon too. In fact, he has now made his reservations at the Rio, thanks to our continuous advocacy of the IPMS National right. Convention, which happens to be his 60th birthday. So he says, see you in Vegas. Well, I hope we see you in Vegas. Come find us. I'll buy you a birthday beer. He says he's trying bourbons. Well, okay, I'll buy you a birthday <laughs> bourbon. Hell, hell I, may try, I may try and smuggle some out from Kentucky. Now that you've told the world. That's all right. The modeling world. I don't, <laughs> I don't, fe- I don't fear the revenue. Next up is Brian Schultz, and uh, he was listening to our Goofs, Gaffs, and Blunders episodes. We might need to do another one of those soon. Yeah, really. Uh, we were talking about stripping paint, and uh, he's coming at it from the model car circles, and uh, those guys use a lot of degreasers as paint strippers. There's one called Super Clean and one called Purple Power. Yep. And you just, you just immerse the uh, model to be stripped in a plastic container for a few hours, sometimes a few days, depending on the paint that was used beforehand. And, uh, you get a clean model. Now, my question back to Brian is, will this stuff attack all the filler you've used? Uh, cause we know like 91% IPA, which I always say is kryptonite for Tamiya paints, uh, will also remove Mr. Surfacer. So yes, if you've done a lot of work with that and you strip it with 91% IPA, you're going to, have to go back and, uh, touch up all your filling again. So I wonder what all this stuff does. Remind me, make a note for the go- for our next goofs and gaffs uh, episode. I've got a great Stu Stu Gordon story about stripping a model. <laughs> I'll make a note of that. Uh, finally, is a uh, Bob Lomasaro from uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. Speaking of the Nationals, uh, we're not there yet. He sent something to the mailbag. That's all right. He says their club in Las Vegas has seen an increase in parents bringing their children to club meetings over the last uh, few years. And uh, 
They come in with only the kid being the builder, but after a few months of attendance, they end up uh, getting the parent hooked as well. <laughs> That's great. That is great. And then uh, he also comments on on uh, your statement in our last episode about clubs. I don't know if you said most clubs or not, but our club anyway, you, you did say that. It kind of can kind of be standoffish when it comes to uh, new visitors coming to a meeting for the first time. Yeah, and I think that's most clubs. Well, he says while that may be the norm, uh, except at their club, they have a welcoming committee and a support network for visitors and new members. And they've seen a steady flow of new members. In fact, until COVID hit, they're experiencing about 10% growth for 2017, 18, and 19, all three. That's fantastic. So it makes me wonder if we ought to try something like that or if any other clubs have a uh, have a welcoming committee or a, or a bandwagon group to get, get new people introduced to others and uh, get it, find, help them find their niche within the club. It's a good idea. That's not a bad idea. Yeah, I agree. Well, that's it for the mailbag. If you'd like to send us a comment or suggestion or critique, please drop us a note at plasticmodelmojo at gmail.com or you can message us on the Facebook page through the messenger function there. We'd love to hear from you. So send us some emails. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'd like to ask the listeners to take a moment when they finish listening to the podcast to go whatever to go to whatever app that they're using to listen and rate the podcast. Please give us five stars to help us become more visible to more potential listeners. Also, if you know some modeler out there who isn't listening, we'd appreciate it if you'd let them know about Plastic Model Mojo. Uh, We've experienced some pretty significant growth over the last uh, couple of months, and uh, it's attributable in, in large part, I think, to you listeners now. So please, if you've got friends in the modeling community who aren't listening to a podcast, aren't listening to Plastic Model Mojo, please let them know how much you enjoy it and please uh, help them get to listening to our podcast. We'd appreciate it. And while they're doing that, they can also check out our fellow podcasts. Scale Model Podcast out of Canada is up to episode 60. And Stu and company are talking about uh, club participation and IPMS. They give a little bit of history on the IPMS Canada. On the Bench is up to episode 98, and it's the boys shooting the breeze with some uh, scale modeling shop talk. And Plastic Posse Podcast rolls in at episode 8, and they're featuring the ever-affable Lincoln Wright, who's always a great guest. And there's also now a new podcast on the front uh, from the UK, from Malcolm Childs and James Skiffins. It's called Just Making Conversation. And uh, you can check that one out as well. That's great news. And while I'm uh, making plugs, we probably ought to plug our, uh, our blog and YouTube friends. So if you want to check out a great blog, that's kind of a, a counter to all the how-to stuff out there going on. Please check out Chris Wallace's uh, Model Airplane Maker blog and our good friend Jim Bates. Yes, check out Jim Bates' it's Scale Canadian TV. And I'm sure those guys would like to have you following their content as well. Absolutely. If you aren't a member of IPMS USA or IPMS Canada or whatever national branch uh, you happens to be in your country that you're listening to us from, please consider joining. Uh, the national organizations do a lot for modelers. Many of those things happen behind the scenes, and we are all better because those organizations ex- exist. So please consider supporting them by joining your national IPMS organization. And once again, it's time for Countdown to Vegas, Dave. Dun, dun, dun. At the time of this recording, we are 260 days away from the 2021 IPMS National Convention in sunny Las Vegas, Nevada. <gasps> well, we are kind of in a slow period between Thanksgiving and Christmas. That goes without saying in this country. Not a lot of extra stuff gets done, does it, Dave? (laughs) No, it does not. In fact, to to be honest with you, I've always in years past referred to that as the dark time because I I would model up until Thanksgiving and then between Thanksgiving and really almost New Year's Day, almost no modeling would get done just simply because of the demands of the holiday season. So I'm kind of hoping to break that a little bit this year. Uh, So COVID may be assisting in that, but uh, 
Uh, again, maybe that's another silver lining to this awful mess, but uh, I am hoping that uh, I'll get a little more bit of modeling done during the quote unquote dark time. Well, there's only 40 vendor tables left to sell. Oh, wow. That's fantastic. So they're about done there and trophy sponsorships are still available. So any individual club or business out there who thinks they might want to do that, they are encouraged to do so sponsor a trophy package. You can go to the website at www.natslv2021.com slash trophy hyphen sponsor. And we'll put that link up as well in the show notes. You can go there. There's a, a PDF you can download to see all the available sponsorships and they're all the payment uh, information is on there as well. And pre-registration is still on track to open February 1st, 2021. So be on the lookout for that. Absolutely. All we got for Vegas this, this time. Uh, one more thing. I highly recommend that when pre-registration opens, if you're going to attend, pre-register. It makes your life so much better than going there and standing in what can sometimes be long lines to do in-person registration. So keep an eye on that February 1st date, and when it opens, go and pre-register. Mike, uh, what's your bench top looking like? It's been busy, which is good. Yeah. You, you mentioned the Paul, the E16A1, the Fujimi kit I've been working on is slowly moving forward. It looks like it's coming along. Well, it looks like an airplane now. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> uh, over my time off, I had a few days off for the Thanksgiving holiday here in the U.S., and I had a goal to get the cowling on and the rear control surfaces on and all integrated into the fuselage, and that goal was met. So it's got a, a cowling, and it's got a vertical and horizontal stabilizers. So like I said, it looks like an airplane now. It looks good. I'm telling you what. I've also hit it with the initial primer coat, and I've been working through the minor touch-ups. Uh, there's a few spots on the uh, the leading edge of the wing. Uh, but I tell you, th th the wing route on this plane was a little tricky. It wasn't terrible, but uh, I had to shim one side up a little bit to get the the rest of the wing route on that side of the plane to, to line up flush. So I had a gap there. What did you use to prime it? I used... Uh, to me, is light gray primer out of the rattle can. Oh, okay. The the wing root was a slam dunk. The filling and contouring were 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 smart were spot on. I was really pleased that that came out as well as it did because I put a lot of work into it. And I was like, oh man, this is just gonna be gaps here. I'm never gonna be. I'm gonna have to get rid of half the seam lines or the half the panel lines around this to get this to go away. But I was really careful, and I took my time and I, and I worked worked it down, and that came out good. And then I got smug and I primed the floats. <sighs> Holy crap, man. It looked like two different people had assembled them. Huh. And, and thinking back, I, I assembled the floats because I knew, like the fuselage, that the floats each had a, a seam around the vertical perimeter, right? So it was a lot like a fuselage in that regard. Because mm. they're splitting, splitting left and right halves. And, man, I've had to go back and do more fill and sand and fill and sand and there is one of them. The the nose on thing is just making me angry. And that was my reason for my walk away night uh, a couple of nights ago <laughs> when we were talking on the, uh, on text message there when I was working. Uh, the, uh, the, the issue, it finally it reared its head. The, the seams are splitting on the noses of these things. Well, one of them I've got finally, but the other one, I think it's the Fujimi plastic and then testers liquid cement. And I've been fixing it using Tamiya Extra Thin. I'm I'm, I'm kind of converting over to Tamiya now. I, I'm finishing up the last bottle of testers, and I'm using the Tamiya instead about half the time. I sent my last two v vials of uh, testers up with my care package to my wife's friend's two sons when I sent those kits up last week. So uh, I, I, hopefully I've got it now. My, my latest fix is I've jammed a piece of 5,000 styrene in the, in the nose of the, one of the floats. Cause there's, there's the gaps gotten so big because I've filled it and reapplied cement so many times that it just won't close anymore. So hopefully with the plastic shim in there, it'll be done. And if it's done, I should have this thing ready to paint or ready to paint. Yeah. In a couple of weeks, I think there's not much left to do on it. Assembly wise. Well, I I'm I'm like you. I've become more and more of a fan of the Tamiya uh, thin and extra thin cements. So uh, 
I, I hear where you're coming from. I think it works better with most pla- most injection plastics. Uh, the Zist 2 has gotten a little attention. I've got the pin washer applied on the gun, sh- gun, the gun shield, and the trunnion. Uh, the split trail has been satin finished. It's ready for the pin washing, so it's it's moved forward a little bit. I need to start working on the base and the accessories to some degree in parallel, so this, this project will close faster. I think I'll, I'll start looking at that this weekend. I'm kind of curious where this one's going because I'm really not sure I like the, the colors I've used on it, but I'm going to keep on trucking with it and see where it ends up. I, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I really like the colors. They, at least in the photographs that you've sent, they really pop. And uh, you know, now keep in mind, you haven't applied any of the dust, mud and all of that stuff that come comes later. But I mean, I, I really like the contrast level that you have on the on the on the gun. Well, maybe that's it. I'm just not used to. I kind of pushed it a little bit with this one, which was the first time I've really kind of reached out there for this kind of technique. Yeah. Uh, the the Reba Botan truck I've been kind of flirting with. I've put some teaser CAD out there to show people. I've been working on the chassis uh, in CAD. And our, I already need to revisit a couple of things I've done. In fact, I took care of some of that today during lunch at work. And I'll probably, once I get that thing to a high level of completion and I'm happy with it, I'm going to get the chassis printed, 3D printed, and I'm probably going to assess that project from there. Because this is going to be a long-term kind of fits and starts kind of project. It's not going to be a, a steady working kind of thing. I'll probably start something else. I know I'll start something else on top of it. I'm just going to kind of see where this goes. Uh, on that note, I'm kind of looking at my next projects. I'm probably going to put another 35th scale armor subject on the bench once something's done and another 72nd scale aircraft. Uh, so we need to do our lists again, man. And yep. uh, maybe maybe talk about that in one of the upcoming two episodes here. After yep, that. Our, 20, our 21, 2021 plan of battle. That... Uh, uh, that's always an enjoyable thing to do. You and I exchanging lists of what we're planning to do and then seeing what un- actually happens. Well, other than all the pomp and circumstance around your uh, AS1 finish, what else you got <laughs> going on besides cleaning your well, bench? Well, wait a minute. I need you to insert the, what is it, trumpet voluntary or hail to the chief or some some celebratory music here that, yes, the AS1 is complete. Um, as I said in my blog post, uh, that it wasn't the best model I've ever built. In fact, it wasn't even close. Uh, but on the other hand, by adjusting my attitude a little bit and taking and taking from it what I learned from it, I, I was able to to be satisfied with it, to be happy with it, and and that in and of itself is. You know, when you're done and if you can be happy with what you ended up with, even if it isn't perfect, that's uh, that's finding the win. And I found the win in that. So the M30, uh, well, I've been cleaning the bench, as you've mentioned. And as I mentioned previously, the M30 is now taking center stage again. Uh, all I have to do is finish up one of the two trails and then... At that point, it's uh, priming and painting. I'm getting to the point where you are on the ZIS. So to be honest with you, I'm going to try to do uh, a lot of the same things that you're doing to see if I can. I mean, this is a huge learning project to me. The last 35th scale uh, artillery piece I've built was in 1996. So what is that, 24 years ago? Um, So I'm hoping this comes out better than that. Uh, I'm I'm also doing a crap load of new techniques, uh, or at least new to me, uh, stuff that you see Uncle Night Shift doing and and other people doing. I'm going to try. And you know what? That's all you can do is try – my plan, how, what's your plan for getting better? My plan for getting better is trying new things and seeing how they work out. Understanding that it's not always going to work out. You got to accept that going in. You got to take the risk. And then uh, the mosquito is uh, 
will also come back to the uh, bench. Uh, it's in the assembly phase, and as the M30 wraps up its final assembly and moves over toward the painting booth, the Mosquito will come back and be my assembly model for uh, the current set of projects. And then I've begun another item, which I'll talk about at some future time, uh, working on something a, a little different for me, something something new. Again, something stretching my boundaries a little bit. And uh, so far, I'm enjoying it, even if I'm also learning how much I don't know and how much uh, I need to improve my technique. So, uh, again... Uh, my bench is my bench is active and it is full of mojo and you can't you can't beat that that's what we that's what we're here for so that's all good news well what what else is on it besides the uh the m30 howitzer well the m30 the mosquito and then this, oh the mosquito uh, the the project that i've just begun uh that i'll talk about at some future point uh coming up soon well, all right. I'm glad you finished another one. Now I'm, I'm looking bad. I got to get something else done now. Kicking my butt. Well, the sad thing is when you finish that, Paul, I'm going to be embarrassed to have my ass kicked by an armor modeler. <laughs> no, you won't. Yeah, I will. Well, what broke your wallet, Dave? Actually, Mike, not much. My wallet's pretty much, well, <laughs> my modeling wallet is pretty much intact. My, given it's the Christmas season and the kids want presents, my regular wallet isn't doing so good. But uh, no, actually, I've been I, I've been a good boy this uh, past few weeks. About the only thing I've acquired is some con- replacing some consumables, um, some testers thinner. Which, by the way, I like using testers branded thinner. Uh, uh, I always have. I I use it for a lot of stuff. And even though you can buy cheaper stuff or, you know, buy in large quantities at Lowe's or whatever, it's a consumable that I buy at the local hobby shop. It supports the local hobby shop. And I like the, the hotness or whatever of that particular thinner. So I bought some of that. I got myself some uh, in infini sanding sticks and uh, some different grits of sand, wet and dry sandpaper. But to be honest, I've actually been pretty good. My my modeling wallet is pretty intact. How about yours? Well, speaking of infini, I bought their detail set for Pit Road's twenty five millimeter anti aircraft gun, Japanese anti aircraft gun, in one thirty fifth scale which is something I've been looking for for a while because it's out of production. And I finally found it in the United States at a good price even. So I bought that. And that's a really neat little, really neat little set. So do, A, did you find it at a store or on eBay? And B, do you have plans for it? I bought it at a web shop out of North Carolina. I'm trying to think of the uh, Spare Time Hobbies or something like that. Spare Time Hobbies, I believe is what it is called. And I do have plans for it. I've got to buy the pit road gun now, and I'm I'm going to do a uh, one of the gun tubs on. I don't know. Those were this this was a standard anti aircraft gun on uh, most uh, Imperial Japanese Navy vessels. Yep, absolutely, from destroyer all the way up. The other wallet breaker is something two years ago I would have never thought I would buy. Um, I bought Azure Models uh, Loire 130 float plane. Actually, it's a flying boat. Oh. And one, in I, 172nd I know exa- scale. I have, <laughs> I have, I have that kit. <laughs> <laughs> the French 30s flying boats and float planes are some of the most interesting aircraft around. Kind of looks like a big grasshopper. It does. Or something like that. It does indeed. <laughs> yeah. So again, that's another float plane catapult combo I want to do. There's a obscure French company that makes a, a French Navy catapult from the thirties and world war two era, uh, that I'm hoping I'm going to pick up over the holiday break. That, that company usually runs a special during that time of year. And I didn't buy it last year. 
uh, hopefully it's still available. I'm going to try to buy that this year. So a future wallet breaker. So stay tuned with that. Uh, that's pretty much it. Um, I've got a shopping list, but I haven't acted on it yet just because I don't need any of it yet. If ever. <laughs> yeah. It's not like I'm, I'm looking for something to build. I'm, I'm surrounded by models, all of which are mocking me saying, build me, build me. So yeah, I, there are some things I'm looking at in the new year. But right now, I think the crazy store is full up at Dave's model shop. Well, if that's all our wallet break in tonight, uh, we can get on to our special segment, which is bases, dioramas, and vignettes. And this topic is uh, an extension on the listener mail we received back in episode 24 from Trolls Nielsen of, of Copenhagen, Denmark. And he asked for our take on dioramas and vignettes, and more specifically, what's the best way to present a model or tell a story, a simple base or a diorama or vignette? Now, I think that's kind of two different questions, really. I agree. Uh, for, first question, I think, is do you want to mount your model on a base, not necessarily a uh, you know, a groundwork base or anything, but just a base of any sort, do you want to mount your model to one? And there are some advantages to it, the, the most common of which is if you truly mount your model to a base, it makes it a whole lot easier to transport. Yep. But uh, now... There, you know, and then you can make a generic base and then you don't have to affix the model to it. You can take and use the same base for different models as you build and complete them and take them to contests. You, a base is a nice way to present what you've built. Uh, now, the one thing you definitely want to do if you take your model to a model contest and you don't have the model affixed to the base is have a nice big sign that says model not affixed to base because there have been over the years a number of modeling disasters where a judge assumed a model was affixed to a base and picked up the base and the model slid off into oblivion. So... Um, uh, you know, definitely if you're not fixing your model here to the base, you want to put a sign there. Uh, in I think this may be a little bit different for aircraft than it is for uh, armor. Rarely do you see an armor model, or model that is put on a base that is a plain base as opposed to a groundwork base. It happens, and you do see it, but it's just so much rarer. Whereas with aircraft models, I think almost always it is either a plane base or at most maybe uh, you know an airfield tarmac type thing. But uh, I think armor modelers, it's it's this is a much more varied subject for them. Do you what do you think? Uh, I think so. Um, for for just bases for models from an armor kind of point of view, I, I agree with the functionality of it. Um, it sure makes them easier to transport. And another advantage that's kind of coincident to that is that you don't have to touch the model anymore. I mean, you can yes. pick it up by the base. Judges can move it by the base. In my opinion, it kind of makes the model less toy-like, in my opinion. I agree. I agree completely. Um, I think a, a disadvantage that's not immediately realized it, it it can increase the footprint of your model. So if you got space constraints and you start basing everything, uh, that's going to start cutting into your your available space. Uh, I, I just think for armor models in particular, uh, you know, even a, a lightly scenic base certainly adds context to the model. Uh, getting back to the less toy like appearance of things, I, I base everything I do on on a small scenic base, uh, typically not a lot bigger than the model, just enough to put it in its element, I think is a, is a good way to go. Well, and, and that's a good point. You were talking about footprints for, for bases. I do think one of the, um, I don't want to call it rookie mistakes, but one of the mistakes that modelers make 
is putting a model on a base that overwhelms it um, because of the fact that, especially if you like you're at a contest, you you want the model to be the center of attention. And if your base is overly large, then it detracts from the model. Even if it's a simple plain base, it just simply your model shrinks in significance to the overall display. From a judging context, it's by IPMS rules that we're used to, it's 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 not supposed to matter. Um yeah. I'm not so sure it, it's not that's so, true. <laughs> it's not supposed to matter. Let me say that again. It's not supposed to matter. But psychology being what it is, I am absolutely convinced that a model on a well-presented base will do better than the exact same model simply sitting on a table. Now, the reverse of that is if the model is on a not well-presented base, I think it detracts from the model. If you have a piece of foam core or mat board and you just put your model on that, it's not attractive. And I do think it not only doesn't help the model, I think it actually detracts from the model. But, But judges are human just like anybody else. And no matter what the rules say, psychology comes into it and if your model is sitting on a, a a really well done base of appropriate size for the model, it can't help but help you. I, I think the judging aspect probably plays back to the uh, the less toy like and putting it in its element and just kind of adds to the overall presentation of the model. I I think you're right. I think psychologically, it's it's almost impossible to separate that out unless you get really technical with your judging. A lot of people do, but... Uh... Yeah, but you still can't help. Be, I mean, no matter what you tell yourself in the front of your mind, I, you still can't help but be affected by the fact that on a well-appointed base, a model is more attractive, and therefore that's going to influence you. Well, outside of just general basing of a model... Um, the the listeners also asking about dioramas and vignettes, which in my opinion is almost another form of modeling art all in itself. Well, it is really, I think uh, I there's agree. a lot more to it beyond the model construction. Well, before we go down that road, sometimes dioramas and vignettes are hard to separate into what that actually means. Yes. And to be honest, I'm not sure I know really if there is a difference. I know the contest judges try to make a difference. And uh, do you know anything about how they're differentiated? You Well, you, yeah, you want a little backstory sure. on this? Uh, because this was, this was a, big issue within IPMS uh, USA's judging over the last uh, number of years. Uh, it used to be that an IP, IPMS USA rules were pretty loose regarding what was a diorama and what was a vignette, and the chief judges at the national contest tended to defer to the entrant as to where they put their model other than, you know, there were some basic, you know, more than five figures, less than five figures. Mm -hmm. And there were some very basic rules, but they were very loose in their uh, interpretation. Well, that led to uh, a number of, times where a modeler would enter in one category and then get his model moved to another category. And uh, so IPMS tried to draw up some more hard and fast rules for what separates a vignette from a diorama. And they came up with uh, some very, very specific rules, some of which are 
viewed by some people as a little bit draconian as far as, you know, uh, if there's a vehicle there, you can't have more than X number of model of figures without it being a diorama uh, as opposed to simply a model on a base uh, with a figure for scale. Uh, it's still all really muddy. Uh, and and I'm not sure they've completely solved the problem yet. The way the best way I ever heard it described was one that is not technical at all, but is subject to a lot of interpretation. And that is, I've always heard that a vignette is like a photograph where a diorama tells a story. A vignette, it, what you're doing with a vignette is attempting to capture a single moment as if there was a photographer standing there taking a picture. Whereas with a diorama, you're getting that single picture, but that picture is telling a story by looking at the base, by looking at the figures, by looking at the accessories and all. It's supposed to tell you not only what that moment in time is, but what is going on in the scene itself. And that's the best, I think that's really one of the best description I, descriptions I ever heard of the difference between a vignette and a diorama. Now, keep in mind that's super subjective, and I understand why IPMS USA and other, other uh, judging systems don't use that description for separating fo uh, dioramas from vignettes. But on some level, I do think that is probably a pretty good description of what you're trying to do. If you're trying to do a vignette, you're trying to present a snapshot in time, whereas with a diorama, you're not only presenting that snapshot, but you're trying to tell a story about what's going on with the with the figures and vehicles that are on the base. Yeah, I think where a lot of people get kind of bent out of shape is the kind of draconian hard and fast a vehicle and X number of figures. Like for instance, if you built a a German eight ton half track and you populated all the bench seats with the crew figures. So now it's got 10 figures on it, but it was never in the intent of the modeler to try to portray either a snapshot in time, like a photograph or tell a story. It's just the half track with 12 guys riding in it. That's, that's, that's not a diorama, but by the hard, fast rules it is. So I think you get into this, uh, subjectivity of it and, uh, which gets back to, to the, to the builder's intent from the start you take that element out of, out of the, the rules or the, the entry placement and yeah, f folks can start to get a little bit upset about that. I, I can understand that. I don't know what the answer is to that, but, uh, certainly like for instance, at this recent right con, I, I entered my little Bofors and, and, uh, Morris tractor. And I, th I said something to you ahead of time before I even seen the, saw the, uh, contest categories this, this is going to end up in diorama I, I just knew it would and it's kind of in that gray area I, all i did was put the box contents on a scenic base that's really all i did yeah but it had two technically two vehicles or whatever right and four figures and a scenic base so in, in that regard it was a diorama right. was that was i trying to tell a story no i was just trying to put my model in its setting well and and keep in mind again this is the the whole thing that these are arbitrary uh, rules for a contest so that they can divide things into categories. You're building for you and what you enjoy and what you want to do. You know, you know whether or not you're trying to tell a story. You know whether or not you're, you're trying to do a vignette or a diorama or all. But when you go to a contest, you just have to be aware there are arbitrary rules to each contest, and you may find that between different contests, a model be, may be a diorama in one and a vignette in another and be able to be entered in the regular armor category in a third. 
Um, and, and accept that that's just arbitrary rules for that particular contest. It doesn't, it doesn't have any effect on you having built and completed the model to your satisfaction. Um, you know, whether you don't need the external validation of a judge, even if it's nice to get it, for it doesn't change what you did with the model one way or another. Well, that's kind of the contest and, and judging aspect of it and what modelers are going to be faced with. Uh, more back to the the art of the whole thing. I, I tell you, these diorama builders, some of them, it's just such a, a next step beyond just the model construction. I, there's there's something about it. Yep. And I, I, I struggle with it because I've conceived these ideas in my head and some of them I've tried to execute, some of them not, but uh, I always seem to come up short because there's, there's some aspects of it. I just can't get my head around the, uh, the composition of the thing to, to, to portray what I'm trying to do. And some of these people are just incredible at it. And I think it's a whole nother game, really. Uh, some of these diorama builders. Um, there's, I, I've just bought recently uh, AFV Modeler magazine. Uh, one of the recent issues, not the most recent, it's issue 114, which is uh, September, October. And a, a modeler has taken a photograph from the Battle of the Hurricane Forest. It's a bunch of uh, German POWs and a few of their American captors all huddled behind an M10 tank destroyer next to a ruined house. And the, the the thing is just incredible, top to bottom. One of the things that I enjoy about dioramas is the level of creativity. Uh, it is, I agree with you, it's a whole nother level beyond, you know, modeling ar- aircraft, modeling armor, modeling whatever. It is the ability of these people to conceive of a scene, even if they take it from a photograph conceive of a scene and execute it with a a whole nother level of artistic creativity. Um, now, I'm not mainly uh, a, an armor modeler, but I love dioramas of all sorts, particularly armor dioramas, because of that level of... Um, of creativity that you see in the storytelling. And, you know, it's not just the Tamiya T-34 or the Tamiya Panther or whatever. It is that in a setting that has been built by the modeler, some of the best ones are scratch built, where they got an idea and were able to put that idea down on a base and make it work. Another thing I think that separates the 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 good ones from the more average ones is a lot of these really good ones don't use stock figures typically. They're almost always reposed and resculpted yep. in some reason to fit the scene and I think that's a big differentiator in dioramas and vignettes. I completely agree. I completely agree. It imparts at most most figures, most stock figures are stiff and the ability to impart movement by reposing a figure really makes a huge difference in the, in the, not only in the figure itself, but in the overall effect of the diorama, because you get a sense of movement and action. Some of the best dioramas are the ones that, even though they are stock still models, give you a sense of of movement of the fact that this is a moment in time that is flowing onward. I think the biggest issue, though, with the uh, stock figures versus repose is not so much the fluidity of it, is... Uh, the fact that is the visual unfamiliarity with them. I think that I goes agree. a long way as well. Doesn't look like the same four figures from uh, Dragon that everybody else is using, which you see a lot in, in diorama entries at IPMS shows. 
Well, you remember in the 1990s, VLS syndrome, when VLS was putting out of all those diorama accessories and figures, and every contest you went to, all the dioramas just looked like pieces from the VLS catalog. Yes. Yeah, I remember that. And you still see some of that. There's a lot of figures out there that are kind of high profile today, even that are still getting overused in that regard. But I tell you, the works that, that have the, if not full sculpts, uh, you know, they may use like horned heads and hands and, and boots and shoes from stock kits, but uh, everything from the joints, all the clothing's all resculpted. The, man, some of those dioramas are just brilliant. So it's just a whole nother level that I've never been able to achieve. And <laughs> I've almost given up on it, really. Well, uh, 70 second scale, in order to make 70 second scale look realistic in a diorama is another level of hard on top of that because of the small size. And there are a couple of modelers out there, um, chief among them, a guy named Steve Hustad out of uh, Minnesota, who does amazing work in 70 second scale with dioramas. Uh, He usually re. Uh, reproduces photographs of downed aircraft and he he accomplishes things that just leave me in awe. Some of my favorite uh, uh, stuff I've ever seen is his stuff and then Douglas Lee's stuff in 35th scale. How about references and how-tos? Do you have many, many books? I, I always would recommend people pick up Shep Payne's How to Build Dioramas as a, as a primer. <laughs> Uh, for how to get how to get going with this <laughs> that that is exactly what i was going to say so many so many diorama modelers would benefit from reading shep bain's shep Payne's sections on composition and and yes. what you can do with composition to make a diorama look better just twisting it on its base just you know uh the imbalancing the 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 thing uh it's amazing how many people who build dioramas do it and violate every one of the rules in Shep Payne's book <laughs> and it shows a lot of times it does absolutely now there's been a lot of newer books come out and I've not managed to check any of those out yet so um I'd be curious what what some of our listeners have to say about diorama construction and and if we have any dioramas out there among our listeners and send us your work, show us what you got. I, I, I've always been most impressed by uh, well-executed dioramas. I I just think they're a level above the model itself. And I'll I'll always say that. Yeah. I think they are the height of modeling. And what I'd love to hear from our listeners is, what modeling or what diorama reference books, what diorama how-to books, besides Shep Payne, which, you know, we all revere, what books do you recommend as being uh, instructive for doing and accomplishing what Mike and I are talking about in the modern diorama world? All right. That'll wrap up our special segment. All right, Mike. Well, uh, do you have any shout outs for the month? I have several shout outs and they're all going to be PayPal contributors to Plastic Model Mojo. We have several more since last episode. Uh, First is uh, Matt Dyer, who we talked about in the listener mail. So thank you, Matt. Uh, Second, Chris Sieber, also known as Luftraum72, has made a contribution to Plastic Model Mojo. Alex Restrepo has hit us again. So now I know how his granddaughter feels. So muchos gracias, abuelo. Appreciate that very much. And then uh, also Chris McLean from Bandera, Texas. Thanks for a great show. I've been with you since the beginning. Well, we hope you're with us for a long time to come. And Stephen Lee, our frequent contributor, who's contributed a lot to our uh, special segments. Uh, we appreciate it, Stephen. Thank you for the contribution. And anyone else making wishing to make a contribution to this effort can do so uh, at our website, www.plasticmodelmojo.com. If you go to the website, there's a heart in the upper right corner that will take you to a PayPal link. And another place you can find it is any episode 
uh, from the website. There's uh, a PayPal link at both the beginning and the end of the show notes. If there are show notes, we don't have them for everything, but I'm trying to be better about that. Uh, you can also find it there. So again, really appreciated folks voting with their wallet means, it means a lot. We're, we've uh, gotten a lot of, a lot of contributions since we, we kicked this off and it's, it's really going to help us out with bringing you the show in the future. So thank you very much. Definitely. Thank you all. It's been, it's, it's heartwarming. You got any shout outs today? Yeah, I got a kind of an unusual one here. Uh, members have heard me talk about uh 72nd scale aircraft forum uh, in the past. Cause it's the, it's the modeling forum that I hang out at the most. And uh, I've, uh, I've, been there for many years and I really like the community. Well, uh, the guy who established it, uh, uh, Robert, um, who established and ran the for or has run the forum, uh, it's been a tough year for him, uh, like it has for many of us. Let's face it, this last year has been difficult for a lot of people. Well, one of the things that uh, that's happened is that he hasn't had time or the ability to properly uh, admin the forum. And so I got asked uh, to step in and uh, come in as the administrator to the forum for 72nd Scale Aircraft Forum. And so I've been doing that for about a week or 10 days now. And uh, I'm learning a lot. It's a tap talk based forum, which is uh, nothing like anything I've ever de dealt with in the past. Um, many, many, many years ago, I was an administrator on a forum. Uh, but this is a whole different world and I'm learning a lot. Uh, but uh, if you're a 72nd scale aircraft modeler and you feel like it, drop on by, register. I'll get you approved right away and uh, come and participate. It's a great group of guys and uh, I, th I think you'll enjoy it. And you can watch me stumble around as I learn what to do and what not to do. Uh, in running a forum. So my shout out is to the forum that I'm now the administrator of. So how's that for self-reference? Well, that's pretty good. And one more thing before we're done. Uh, episode 27 will be the last of the 2020 uh, year for us as far as episodes go, but I'll save the reminiscence for that episode. That said, we will have have successfully completed our first year. It's all, that's incredible. Really. I can't believe it. Uh, it. It's flown by, hasn't it? No doubt. So in the coming couple of weeks before we actually record that episode, tell us what you think of our efforts and uh, let us know what you'd like to hear about in 2021. So that'd be a big help to getting us kicked off for uh, the next, uh, the next 12 months of plastic model mojo. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Mike, it's getting to be that time. Yeah, I think we're getting to the end, Dave. So as they say, so many kits. So little time. See you later.